Hello and welcome to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I'm Catherine Hadro in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thanks for joining us. In this week's show, a Nigerian pro-life leader responds to President Emmanuel Macron's comments on large African families. A twist of faith. We speak out against prayers for Planned Parenthood. And this. Tell anybody, you know, look at look at your kids, look at your family. You know, mm -hmm. could you imagine your life without any one of them? Super Bowl champion Matt Burke lays out his family's pro-life priorities in part two of our exclusive interview. But first, we tell you what you need to know ahead of the United States 2018 midterm elections. Unborn babies deserve protection. You can make the difference. Vote pro-life. Millions of Americans prepare to vote in the midterm election on Tuesday, November 6th. A large number of House, Senate, and governor's races are held in the middle of a president's term, hence the word midterms. All 435 seats in the U.S. House of Representatives will be voted on, 35 seats in the Senate, and 36 states will vote for governor. Joining us now to break it all down is Marilyn Musgrave, a former U.S. representative for the state of Colorado and currently the vice president of government affairs for the Susan B. Anthony List. Congresswoman, it's great to have you back. It's wonderful to be here. Looking at these midterm races, which ones will have the greatest impact on the pro-life movement? Well, there are a lot of great pro-life heroes that are running. I think of Mia Love, and I, I, I look at her race, it's incredibly close. Uh, I, I look at Marsha Blackburn, who's running for the Senate. Both of these ladies have been in our National Pro-Life Caucus. And uh, they are in races that are so tight. There's so much at stake here. I look at Kathy McMorris Rogers in Washington State. That's not an easy place to be pro-life. But uh, Kathy has beautiful little Cole and her other children. He's Down syndrome. I know you've had her on the program. She's a wonderful pro-life leader and the highest ranking Republican woman in Congress. Her race is incredibly tight. So we have these races that there is so much at stake. And then the United States Senate, uh, you know, we don't have 60 votes in the Senate, even though we've had a pro-life House of Representatives that's passed great legislation. We still haven't had that 60 vote margin in the Senate and we're hoping to add there. And again, Catherine, you look at these races, you look at Indiana, you look at Montana, you look at Arizona. You know, we have a great pro-life lady, Martha McSally, running in Arizona. We have Matt Rosendale, pro-life man in Montana, running against Tester. In West Virginia, we have Patrick Morrissey that's running against Joe Manchin. And uh, Joe Manchin is, says he's pro-life, but his voting record does not reflect that. And again, these races are neck and neck, and here we are getting close to the finish line. Uh, in addition to candidates, there are also a few issues on the ballot concerning yes. the life issue. Can you highlight some of those? Yes, there are three of those. There's one in Oregon that has to do with banning taxpayer funding of abortion. Again, that's a very tough state for any kind of pro-life initiative. Uh, there's one in Alabama on uh, uh, taxpayer funding of abortion and rights of the unborn child. And the one that Susan B. Anthony List is really honed in on is in Virginia, in West Virginia. Mm. And that one would ban taxpayer funding of abortion. Several years ago, the state uh, Supreme Court made a decision that caused the taxpayers of West Virginia, and this is a pro-life state, mm -hmm. caused the taxpayers to have to fund abortion uh, to the tune of about $10 million and 35,000 abortions of precious children. And so this ballot initiative is very important to us because we're already there. We have 75 canvassers. We have visited over 50,000 homes, and we're telling people about how Senator Joe Manchin votes on the life issue and we're also informing them about the ballot initiative. So it's important that our viewers look to see what their candidates stance is on life but also look to see if there are any initiatives like this on their ballot. That's absolutely well. true. Congressman, you as I mentioned were a former U.S. representative for Colorado. Pro-lifers have had control of the U.S. House of Representatives for a few years now so if that shift were to change and as some forecasters are predicting that it might change to being control of uh, pro-choicers. What would that look like? 
in the House of Representatives. I have to tell you, I was in Congress uh, when the Democrats took control, and uh, we did have a couple of faithful pro-life Democrats, Colin Peterson, uh, Dan Lipinski, Henry Cuellar, when I was in Congress, Dan Burton. But still, when Nancy Pelosi became Speaker, it was like night and day. Absolutely nothing on a life issue. No pro-life bills will ever be heard. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to appropriations where pro-lifers get the writers, that's uh, congressional speak for amendments to the appropriation bills where we get our pro-life wins, mm -hmm. none of those would be happening. None under Nancy Pelosi, who would likely be the speaker. So it's a different world for the life issue. We've made such progress in the House of Representatives. You know, we're looking to the day that we have 60 votes in the United States Senate, but defunding Planned Parenthood, redirecting those do dollars to uh, providers that do not perform abortion, but provide comprehensive health care for women. You know, passing uh, the 20-week bill, banning abortion after the fifth month of pregnancy, born alive legislation, mm -hmm. you know, helping that precious child that has survived an abortion, giving it medical care. Those kinds of things will not be happening if, if the House uh, goes to the Democrats under Speaker Pelosi. Believe me, it's a different world. A lot rides on this election. Marilyn Musgrave, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you for your insight this week. You're very welcome. The clock is ticking until Tuesday, November 6th, when millions of Americans will vote in the 2018 midterm elections. While the midterms historically have lower turnout rates, we need the pro-life movement to show up at the polls. That brings us to this week's very important call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and pledge to vote pro-life this November 6th. Once you get to our website, ProLifeWeekly.com, you just type in your name and your very basic information to get to our pro-life petition. As Americans, the right to life is the first right. And as Catholics, while we don't fit comfortably into one specific political party, we do have a responsibility to protect our littlest and most vulnerable ones. No Catholic can take a pro-choice stand when that choice in question involves the taking of innocent human life. Let's send a strong pro-life message this election. With a countdown on until November 6th, be sure to educate yourself on your state's candidates and go to ProLifeWeekly.com to pledge to vote pro-life. We go now to pro-life headlines from around the globe. A Labour Member of Parliament proposes an extreme abortion bill in the UK. The proposed bill would force legal abortion on Northern Ireland and void the Abortion Act 1967, which established a 24-week limit on the procedure throughout Great Britain and requires women to get approval from two doctors before getting an abortion. While the bill passed through the initial legislative steps, it's unlikely to pass the House of Commons. Meanwhile, in Mexico, two Mexican legislators introduced different proposals to legalize abortion. One congresswoman introduced a bill designed to recognize what she called the right of self-determination of women over their body and life. Another congressman proposed an amendment to Mexico's constitution for a right to decide, quote, whether to have children or not. Abortion is a crime at the federal level in Mexico, permitted only in cases of rape. And Queensland legalized abortion Lawmakers in the Australian state voted 50 to 41 to permit abortion up until the 22nd week of pregnancy. Abortion had been illegal in Queensland since 1899. We're going to stay on that global front with our next guest to discuss recent controversial comments from France's president, Emmanuel Macron. We're joined now by Obianuju Ekiocha, the founder and president of Culture of Life Africa, as well as the author of Target Africa. Uju, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Catherine. It's always great to be here. It's great to have you. First off, let's get started. Let's take a look at those controversial comments that President Macron recently made. I always say, please present me the lady who decided, being perfectly educated, to have seven, eight, nine children. What's your reaction to that? Wow, this is, uh, I mean, speaking as an African woman, one of many children uh, of my mother. 
Uh, this is quite an insult. It's, it's very patronizing, I'd say, um, and, and even in many ways derogatory for women who want to have a career on one hand, but who also want to have a large family on the other hand. So it's, it's a, a terrible thing, I think, for a world leader like President Macron to go out on a major stage like, like that uh, with all eyes on him to make this kind of comment. Uh, what does that say to women and the women who feel that they should have the choice? You know, if they wanted to have a large family and a career at the same time, they shouldn't have to give one up for the other. And as you mentioned, Uju, you do come from a large family yourself, one of six, I believe, from yes. Nigeria. Yes. What would you want to say to President Macron and other people who hold those ideas about what it's really like to be in a large family? I mean, people are doing it. My mother was never a stay-at-home mom, not even once she had a full career in Nigeria as a teacher. But she wasn't, it wasn't even anything extraordinary because a lot of her friends had, you know, seven, six, uh, nine, eight children, as Macron had said, show me. My, uh, President Macron, I'll show you my mother. I'll show you my mother's friends. I'll show you my aunties uh, and, and our family friends who decided that they wanted this large family because to us, a child born, you know, even as the international world is looking at this African baby born as a, an unnecessary increase in population, but for us, every baby born uh, is a new member, a valued member of our community of love. So uh, I tell him it's possible, it's done. People have done it in the past. People are still doing it now. Uh, one of my very close friends is one of nine. Uh, and, and it's a normal, you know, it's a normal family. Uh, I grew up knowing my, my siblings, loving them, having the support of not just my parents, but also lots of brothers and sisters around me, my own parents. My dad particularly has, uh, comes from a large family. So for us, that's a gift because that means I have so many aunties and uncles who love us uh, all the time and who are very much a part of our lives. It's a beautiful gift. What do you think, Uju, the pro-life movement can do to counter this misconception that women cannot advance in their career in education and have a large family? It's an insult to women. Mm -hmm. You know, women are, women are strong and resilient, and women uh, can do exceptionally well in whatever career they choose. But also, on the other hand, I believe that God has given us this gift of, you know, maternity, this gift of mm -hmm. femininity that we, uh, you know, find is uh, perfected in motherhood. So women can have it. We can, you know, we can go out and be a doctor, be a scientist, be a nurse, but still go home and, and be that mother, you know, the mother who is irreplaceable within the family and be able to uh, give love to children, give birth to children, give love to children and raise them, you know, and raise them in the right and in best way possible. So women can do it, women have done it, women continue to do it. Uh, so we say please stop for those who have this agenda and who, those who are pushing women really hard, trying to get us to think in just one way, one, you know, they want a monolith. Uh, but no, not all women want to give up family. Not all women want to remain childless in order to have a career. We want to have it all. And I say they should let us. It's beautiful. And these comments that President Macron made were made at a Gates Foundation event. And I know that you are familiar with Bill and Melinda Gates. What are they trying to do in Africa? What is their agenda? This is something that worries me because I, a lot of people who know me know that I came into the pro-life movement because of an open letter to Melinda Gates that I had written uh, back in 2012 when she was pushing for a family planning uh, movement around the world at the time. Now, it has progressed from that because at that point in time, we saw she was working on her own. She was moving this whole contraception thing on her own. Uh, now, it's so much bigger. Why? Because Bill has suddenly joined her. It is now a joint uh, effort by these two very powerful people. They are a real life power couple. Now they have this uh, initiative, brand new initiative called the Goalkeepers Initiative. And that's exactly, as you said, where President Macron was, where he made the comment. It was at a Goalkeepers event. Uh, and twice, in fact, rec very recently, we have heard uh, a very similar message in a very similar statement, which is this. Uh, that African women's fertility is a problem, that African women's fertility uh, cannot go hand in hand with economic development. So there was once when Macron had made the statement, but also the uh, editor-in-chief of Vox.com went on Twitter and made this horrible comment about the biggest problem in the world being the increasing population in Africa. And this was really on the heels of a podcast that he had done with Bill Gates about the goalkeepers event. So there is a, an agenda there which is really uh, unfolding and we're watching it. And what kind of message does that send? 
it's awful. I mean, this is population control. Mm -hmm. um, this is eugenics that I think it's a very eugenic message that they are forming now, but it's also a very sleek message because they're putting it out, not not like before where perhaps, uh, you know, a population control message is undesirable or it's, you know, it's ugly and people don't like it. But now they're putting it out as something really nice, something sleek um, in this very beautiful packaging. I would say goalkeepers event, so beautiful, so posh, uh, lots of important people there and President Macron says this. Of course, he goes to Vox.com. They're having this, this podcast that a lot of people listen to and he puts out the same messaging. And I think we're just going to see more of that. Uh, and it's something that I think everybody should watch out for, the Goalkeepers event and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and what they are doing with their friends. Well, thank you for your voice and for your witness. Obinuju Ekiocha, Culture of Life Africa and author of Target Africa, thank you for being here. Thank you, Catherine. When we come back. Adoption is, a, is, is certainly a, it's, it's an option that doesn't get mentioned enough. Super Bowl champion Matt Burke and father of eight opens up about how he lives out his pro-life beliefs at home. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. For this week's Speak Out, we condemn an event that twists Christianity to fit an abortion agenda. The Ohio Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice will host a, quote, clinic blessing at an Ohio Planned Parenthood abortion facility next Friday. Organizers said they want to show that, quote, anti-abortion advocates do not have the monopoly on faith or God. They even claimed that, quote, many faith leaders and people of faith hold that accessing and providing abortions are good and godly decisions. The last time we checked, the Planned Parenthood page announcing this event was curiously taken down. Just because you put a collar on it doesn't mean it's truth. Be warned, my friends, this event is a perversion of faith, and these clergy members are false shepherds. While no one person or group has a monopoly on God, God does have a monopoly on life. The author of Life Alone has the say on when life begins and ends. This Planned Parenthood event has been dubbed, quote, holy ground, blessing the sacred space of decision. But there is nothing holy about ending innocent life. Instead of blessing the abortion facility, we as people of faith should pray for the souls of the unborn, healing for their parents, and for a change of heart for the Planned Parenthood staff. Lord, have mercy on us. But remember, there is always something you can do to counter today's culture of death by following this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and pledge to vote pro-life for the midterm elections this November 6th. From the football field to his family, our next guest is never shy from discussing his pro-life views. Super Bowl champion and father of eight, Matt Burke, opens up to us about what's shaped his pro-life views, ranging from his Catholic faith to his loving wife. In part two of our exclusive interview, Burke starts off with answering when he first identified as being pro-life. Well, I guess, I mean, I've always been pro-life, but and this might be just more first-person historical accounts, but when I was in grade school in the 80s, you know, we went down to the Capitol, we marched. Mm. Um, and in the 90s, I was in high school and college, it didn't seem like abortion was, was that, was, was, a, was a topic of national conversation. Like maybe it's sort of just mm -hmm. been flying under the radar. I could be wrong. I know there were a lot of people fighting the mm -hmm. battle then. So, um, but then uh, when I got, uh, when I got married and uh, the first thing is I, the birth of my first daughter. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that was the first maybe the, fir the first time that I had realized that I'd witnessed a miracle when wow. a child, my child was born. Uh, even though something happens millions of times a day, doesn't mean it's not a miracle. Um, and then my wife began to volunteer at Life Centers. And um, so I was just, you know, kind of the supportive husband, wow. you know, being busy playing football. But where I really, I think, stepped out and where, where the flame was lit inside of me for the pro-life movement was when I was playing for the Ravens. Uh, one day my phone rang. It was the Archbishop of Baltimore. And he asked me to come speak at the at the Maryland March for Life, okay. and I never stepped out publicly. Not that I was avoiding it, but just never 
had never been that involved. And when I went there, and what really, what really I think changed it for me was uh, I was talking to a woman as we were marching, and I asked her why, why she was there. And she had told me that she was an abortion survivor. And at the time, I, I didn't know what I had said. I said, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what that means. Right. And she said, well, when I was 18 years old, I had an abortion, and uh, I regret it. It still hurts, and I just don't want anybody else to make the same mistake. And I just thought, you know, that witness right there, like who cares what a football player has to say, but that witness right there of a woman who's, who's had an abortion, and I could see that the pain was, it was many years ago, the pain was still very real. It's like it was still fresh. Hmm. And that night I met hundreds of women who were abortion survivors. Wow. And I thought, okay, we talk about from, a, from an intellectual standpoint, right? I mean, there's hundreds of women there and millions of women in our, co our country mm -hmm. that regret having an abortion. Mm -hmm. If you go to the March for Life in Washington, you, there's thousands and thousands. I've never met a woman that gave birth to a child and said, well, I wish I'd have had an abortion, right? So logically, it just, it just doesn't make any sense. And how does your Catholic faith support your pro-life views? Well, the Catholic faith, I mean, we're, you know, the Catholics have been the ones, we've been front and center on this issue since, since the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I say I was, you know, it was an issue and then it wasn't. The Catholic Church has been, has been fighting this fight, been on the front mm -hmm. lines the entire time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, proud, I'm proud of my faith. I'm proud of my church for, for doing that. And, uh, you know, as we know, those of us that are involved, there's, there's like anything, there's good times, there's bad times. It's a hard, long fight. You go to, you go to life centers and you, you, you talk to the workers there. You go, to a, go out in front of a Planned Parenthood and you talk to those sidewalk counselors. I mean, every time that a woman chooses to have an abortion, you know, when you're working with a and she chooses mm. death for her child, I mean, that's, that's, like, that's like a body blow every time, right? There's lots of tough days. But, so I, so I'm, 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 proud of, I'm proud of my church and, and my faith for, for leading the way. I'm a Knight of Columbus, which mm -hmm. is a, which I don't know how many ultrasound machines and how many lives have, have been saved because of, because of the Knights, but this is, like, this is, this is our issue as a, as a church. You have eight children, and you mentioned you're an adoptive father as well. And you were speaking about your adoption journey. How did that change even your view on life and being pro-life, having this adopted son? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> so we, we, we have two adopted sons that are wow. they're only six months apart. We were actually sort of chosen at kind of about the same time by two, two birth mothers. Uh, it's incredible. So it was, we, we didn't know, you know, you, Anybody who's opened themselves up for adoption, you never know. And then it's like, ah, you're going to have two. It's like, oh, okay, great. Um, <laughs> daily double, you know, God's, <laughs> God's plan. Uh, you know, yeah, going through it with the, uh, with the birth mothers, going mm -hmm. on the journey sort of mm -hmm. with them by their side, two very different experiences, but mm -hmm. seeing how, um, how, how for, for women, you know, this is not, a, it's not an easy decision. You say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to, you know, it's hard because this is, this is your baby. Um, but witnessing that, that love. I mean, you know, when we talk about love, and I think it's mm -hmm. in our, right, love is sometimes we make it like duckies and bunnies and rainbows, right. but love, love hurts, love's painful. You know, love is about sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And probably daily when I look at both my sons, I think of, I think of their birth mothers, and I'm just in awe. Um, and everybody knows, you know, adoption is, a, is, is certainly, a, it's, it's an option that, doesn't get mentioned enough, but I look at uh, how that's just changed and, and you know, made our family even, even more whole. And I know that there's millions and millions and millions of couples out there who want to adopt. I mean, why not? It's such a, it's such a better, better choice than abortion. It's beautiful. Tell us about your wife, Adriana. I understand she volunteers at pro-life pregnancy centers. Is that right? Well, she was the one, yeah. She started volunteering at, at pregnancy centers and, and uh, you know, kind of got the, our family on the on the pro-life pro-life track mm. no but she's um you know yeah i'm all, all my kids like mom better than dad you know <laughs> she's just she's just very um she's 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 very warm you know it's like she was god put her on earth to be a to be a wife and a and a mother and she's mm. she's fantastic and she was actually the one too that um we talked about adopting for a long time and uh you know sort of i was I don't, I don't know if I was ever going to bring it up, but she brought it up again. She said, you know, I, I'm feeling called that we need to, we need to make ourselves officially open um, for, for adoption. And, uh, you know, I, you know, obviously I pray about it. I can't say like that was 100% my will at the time. 
Um, I, mean, I had some reservations, and well, I don't know, if, are we supposed to? And then, uh, you know, to be blessed with two adoptive sons, it's like, you know, yeah, she, my wife knows what she's doing, and, you know, thank God I didn't, thank God I, I didn't get in the way. I mentioned you have a large family, eight children. What kind of reaction do you get from people who might not be used to seeing yeah. that many kids? And how do you respond to questions like, are you guys done? Are you guys, do yeah, you guys have enough? Yeah, how, how, how do you deal with that? Uh, normally I deal with, try to deal with, with humor because it's because it's funny to me. I don't mm -hmm. really take offense to it. You know, I, I get it. Back in the day, right, it was just kind of the default. Everybody had 8, 10, 12 kids and whatever. Now it's, it's more rare. Um, I say not everybody's had the same experiences I've had, or not everybody's been exposed to the same things I have. So, um, yeah, I try to um, I, I, I try to respond with humor most of the time. Uh, you know, people say, "Oh my gosh, what's wrong with you?" I'm like, "Yeah, I don't know. I just like making love to my wife or something." You know, uh, right. I try to kind of put it back on them and right. and uh, gently point out that they the might truth. not the, the truth and that they um, they might want to think about what they're saying. But I'll tell you yeah. what, it's on the flip side too. Is so many people come up and. Um, they'll say, oh, I was one of 10, big families are the best, or, you know, I had, I had eight kids, I wish I'd had eight more. Yeah. So, you know, the big family, there is kind of like a, a connection out there with us big family people, you know, like we're, we're in the club and <laughs> it's a little bit competitive, you know, so I'm like, well, we have nine or 10. I was like, okay, you well. You have your own sports team. Yeah, so. you know, I said, well, it's not, a, or people are like, I only had five. I said, well, it's not a contest. You know, right. I mean, hey, you just, you just have fun with it. But I mean, gosh, you know, I, I, I asked. Tell anybody, you know, look at look at your kids, look at your family. Could, you mm -hmm. know, could you imagine your life without any one of them, right? Mm. Like if you had six kids, you know, could, could you imagine your life without number six? No, you, you couldn't, right. right? It's like every every family is every family is perfect. Matt Burke, thank you so much for your witness and for taking time to be with us. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again to Super Bowl champion Matt Burke for taking the time to sit down with us and share his pro-life witness. That does it for this edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, but I'd love to hear from you before next week. Email me at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com or like my public page on Facebook so we can keep this pro-life conversation going. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.